sentence to death, the second death, an eternity in hell. Why did Jesus die? So that man could live. Did he not say that to Martha? John 11, turn there, please. When he spoke to Martha, when he was coming to the tomb where they had laid Lazarus, Jesus says these words to Martha. She says this, he says this in chapter 11 of John, verse 25. And I'll just go back to bring it in context because Martha has seen Jesus coming. Remember, Jesus put off his journey to the tomb of Lazarus because he wanted Lazarus to be well and truly dead (laughs) so that there was no trickery behind everything and this wasn't staged. So when he turns up there, he sees them all weeping and of course that saddens Jesus because of what sin has done and he actually weeps because of what sin has done that has caused Lazarus to die. So I'll take it up at verse 23 where he says, Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And see, that's a promise that Jesus gives each and every one of us. That all those that put total trust in him for their salvation will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am. I am, declaring his God, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You see, that's the gospel. The gospel centres around the resurrection. That's why Christians should get excited about the resurrection. You know, I go to some churches and it's, oh, happy day. And there's no joy. There should be joy because of the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. Is that right, Kemp? Say hallelujah, don't be scared. You know, Jesus had to die, but he had to rise again. He had to overcome death. He had to break that hold that death had over mankind. He had to set all the captives free because until we put our faith in Christ, we were all captives to sin. You were slaves to sin. I was a slave to sin. And I still would be a slave to sin except for the righteousness of my Lord and the power that he places in me to be able to overcome the sins and obstacles in my life by the Holy Spirit. You see, a lot happened in the death and resurrection of Christ. Go to Genesis chapter 3. I just want to remind you of something. I want to show you a few parallels when we come to John 20. Genesis 3. So we all know the story, don't we? Eve's in the garden with Adam. God has told them they can have of all the trees, the fruit, except one. And the serpent appears to Eve, understanding that Lucifer is a bright and shining angel. He's an angel of light. He's not this beast with horns and a tail and a pitchfork in his hand. Uh, The serpent is just describing... Uh, He's a deceiver. He's evil. So I'll just take it up to when he has deceived Eve and has told her 
and questioned the fact of would she surely die. And he goes on and says, For God knows, verse 5, that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Us men are pretty gullible, aren't we? When it comes especially to women. We get seduced very easily. Oh, men, where would we be without women, though? I just told you, back in the Garden of Eden. Anyway, let's move on. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. That's the picture of sin. It's the nakedness. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, which he used to do with Adam. And Adam... And his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. You've got to be kidding me. Among the trees of the garden. He created it. <laughs> Where are they hiding? Oh. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? You see, that was the grace of God. He was giving Adam an opportunity to come forward of his own volition and face God and to confess his sins. You see, but Adam wouldn't do that. He says, Adam, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself and he said, who told you you were naked? You see, that's how innocent they were. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, I love this. This is typical, isn't it? Talk about scapegoats. Listen to this. Then the man said, The woman who you gave to me, God, she gave me of the tree and I ate. It's your fault. You gave me the woman. (laughs) Hey? So God's the first scapegoat. (laughs) And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, the devil made me do it. Hey, another scapegoat. (laughs) They just wouldn't confront their own sin. So the Lord, this is important, listen. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he, talking about the coming Messiah, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's Jesus being victorious over the devil, crushing him. To the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, this is the big one, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you. Adam, it's your sin, Adam. You could have stopped it, Adam. You didn't take up your responsibility, Adam. I formed you first. I gave you the command. You were to watch over your wife, to protect your wife. You failed. So... You have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Listen, cursed is the ground for your sake. And it goes on. God cursed this world. He gave man over to their desire to be like God. And boy, haven't we grabbed that and run with it.
and have become so prideful and so sinful. We saw how depraved and sinful mankind is when we celebrated together Good Friday, didn't we? We saw how depraved they were. Crucify him, free a terrorist and a murderer. Because we like the sin. We like those things that are sinful. So free Barabbas, crucify the Christ because our flesh doesn't desire the things that are holy and righteous. That's not our natural makeup now. We're like our father Adam. Our hearts are desperately wicked and sick. No wonder Christ had to die for us. No wonder he had to take our sin upon himself and pay the penalty for it. I thank God that he imputed his righteousness into me because of the faith I now place in him because my eyes have been opened to the truth concerning him. I read Genesis 3 because we see so many parallels between that and John 20. You see, when we see Jesus... In John 20, let's go there. We're going to stay there now, I promise. John 20. When we go there, we we take it up on the first day of the week. So Jesus has been in the tomb for three days. Remember what they did. So that, that, that Jesus was going to be totally sealed away, they put a large stone over the entrance of Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. This tomb that, guess what, was in a garden. They put the stone over it. They sealed it. They put a guard on it. You all know the story, don't you? And here's Magdalene. And of course there were other women with her. But here John picks Magdalene. By chance? No. We all know who Mary Magdalene was, don't we? She was the one that was delivered of seven demons. The word number seven means completeness. So she was completely indwelled by the demonic spirits. So she was as evil as they come. But Jesus delivered her of all those demons. And Magdalene on the first day of the week, which is where we get the celebration, where we come together on a Sunday, went to the tomb early while it was still dark. And you know the story. She sees the stone has been removed. You know, that stone didn't even need to be removed. Jesus could have just walked out of there. The same as he just walked through the walls of the upper room when the door was shut and just stood there and appeared to him and said, peace be with you. So why is the stone removed? Because people had to see that he had rose from the dead. They had to look inside the tomb. It was an angel that rolled the stone away. It would have taken a great number of men to remove that stone. And here's a woman in a garden. There was Eve in the garden. Eve would be beguiled by the serpent. Magdalene was delivered. From the demonic. Eve was seduced by the demonic. In a garden. (laughs) In a garden. So many beautiful pictures through scripture. You know, in the Garden of Eden, it was a place of Beautiful fellowship, wasn't it? 
when it was created, where Adam would walk with God, but then Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and the Lord cursed the ground, and he banished them. Banished them from paradise. Banished them from the garden. What happens when we read through this chapter of John after Mary, out of dismay, sees that the tomb has been interfered with, her thoughts are someone has overcome the guards and has taken the body of Jesus. So with all this going on in her head, she races off and tells Peter and John. And of course, they run to the tomb. John's quicker than Peter. John gets there first, but out of probably fear, doesn't go into the tomb, just in case there's a corpse in there, which, mind you, would have been smelling by this date, three days. So he doesn't go in, but then Simon Peter, hey, you've got to give it to Simon Peter, eh? Oh, Simon, here he comes. You know, he's bolting in. And you, hey, I'm first. I'm going straight in there, just like I stepped straight out of a boat and needed to be saved, even though I walked for a while. Goes straight into the tomb and he sees just the linen cloth laying there. Just the linen cloth. And then John decides to have a look. And Mary, she's outside the tomb. Peter and John, they're probably gone away totally thinking that someone's robbed the body of Jesus and taken it away. As Don rightfully pointed out, it was Lara Croft, the tomb raider had been. So they leave. And then they leave Mary there, Magdalene. She's there weeping. Then she stoops down and looks inside the tomb. And what does she see? This, what, this is so beautiful. She sees two angels. One at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laying. It's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. It's a picture of the mercy seat. When you see Peter and he's running straight in there, he doesn't realise it yet. He's able to go straight to the mercy seat of Jesus. That's the picture. We can see it now, can't we? Angel at each end, the mercy seat, where the blood was sprinkled. His blood-stained body laid there. <laughs> the angels. We can look at it even further. Angels always came to minister to Jesus. Angels were, were there at his birth. Angels were there in the garden when he was crying out to his father to, if the cup could pass him by, but then said, nevertheless, thy will, the angels were there, spurring him on to fulfil the will of the father, which he did. But go back to the garden. When Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, what were placed at the entrances to the garden? Angels. But now the angels 
are not stopping man from coming into the presence of God. They're allowing man to come into the presence of God. They're proclaiming the good news, just like they proclaimed the good news and sang hallelujah at his birth. This is why they say to Mary, why are you weeping? She says, they've taken my Lord. When she had said this, she turned around. And what does she see? A gardener. What was Adam? A gardener. Ooh. First Adam that fell the sin was a gardener. The second Adam appears to give salvation as a gardener. And he appears to the woman the same as the serpent appeared to the woman. There are so many parallels here. One is depicting death, the other is depicting life. So Mary, when she turns around, Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, do you see how personal God is? He calls us by name. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. John 10. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. Mary, that's all he had to say. And what'd she say? Rabboni, which meant teacher, master. Her eyes were open to who it was straight away. And then she realised that Jesus has rose from the dead that he lives. He lives. So why are there so many parallels? I'll tell you, this is my conclusion on why they, these parallels are there for us today. It shows us that Christ has overcome the curse that came through the sin of Adam and Eve. The death and resurrection we observe and remember this Easter demonstrates to us how Christ and only Christ had the ability to fulfil all requirements necessary to reverse the effects of the fall spoken of in Genesis 3. Genesis 3, I read it. When you read it, all it does is bring pain to us in remembering that it was our sin that caused us to become in bondage to sin and as a result of this caused a separation from God's presence. John 20 illustrates not just a healing but a deliverance and the restoration of fellowship with God. You see that all with that picture of Magdalene. So what does Magdalene do? Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. She proclaimed the good news. As he said to Martha has come to pass. He is the resurrection and the life. He also fulfilled the words that he spoke when he said, they do not take my, my life, but I lay my life down. No man takes it from me. I lay it down because I, Jesus, have the power to lay it down and I, Jesus, have the power to take it up again. That's why he can say, I am the resurrection and the life. 
That's why he can say there is only one way to the Father and that is through me because I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the narrow gate that takes man into the very presence of God. I am the one that will come on the clouds and receive you to myself. And we see that in the martyrdom of Stephen. And that only happens because of the death and because of the resurrection. There is no faith if there is no resurrection. John 20 illustrates healing, deliverance, restoration of fellowship with God. Mary goes and gives the good news to the disciples that she's seen the Lord, that he's spoken to her. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, remember they ran away at his crucifixion. Peter denied him. They were afraid because they were afraid that the Jews would put them to death. Death by stoning, by being rebellious. So they're locked away in this upper room and Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, peace be with you, he said, shalom. When he had said this, he showed them his hands, his side. The disciples were then happy, they were glad, they rejoiced, you see. There's joy today, not sadness There was sadness Friday. Today we rejoice. You know, they call it Good Friday. That's why I said they shouldn't call it Good Friday. It was a a very dismal day in history because Christ had to die because of me. An innocent man had to die in my place. That was a sad day. This is a joyous day. This is a, a good day. This is a day where we can say because of Christ we can now share in his resurrection. We we know we have eternal life because my Saviour lives. He lives. And he lives inside each and every one of us by his Holy Spirit. That's how I know he lives. I know because I know and I know and I know I am I am totally convinced I, I don't even have to see him. Not like Thomas. So the disciples rejoice and but Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples said to him, We've seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see him. (laughs) Come on, God, prove yourself. (laughs) Everybody wants to have something manifest before them, before they'll believe in God. Yet listen to what God says. The disciples give him the good news. They proclaim the gospel. To him, that even though Christ has died, he has rose again, just as he said. He has victory over death. He is the Almighty One. He is the Messiah, Son of God, the Son of God. We have seen the Lord, so he said to him, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, eight is very significant. Remember, after eight days, an infant was circumcised, which was a sign of of purity, of being brought into the household of God, into Israel. Do you see that? Eight days, very significant here. Um, Christ has been ascended to the Father. He's back again, a new resurrected body. He appears to him after eight days, his disciples again, Thomas being shut and stood in the midst and he said again, Shalom. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here, put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. If that's what it's going to take, 
than here. Do it. Touch me. Shows you something about the resurrected body, doesn't it? Flesh and bone. No blood mentioned, but flesh and bone. You can touch. Guess what? We're going to have another body, but it's going to be a glorious body. Why? Because it's a glorified body. No sin. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, because that's what faith is. Abraham didn't know the journey he was about to go on, but God called him out and he just came out from among the Chaldeans that he lived with. He just came out. Faith is placed in the things hoped for, in the evidence of things not seen. I don't see God. I don't see the face of God. I don't see Jesus. Jesus is the face of God, by the way. But I know he's here. I know he lives within me. How do I know that? Because he's accomplished great things in me. I've overcome sins that I thought I would never overcome, that I'd be in bondage to for the rest of my life. But I can stand here and testify today, I have overcome many sins in my life and I continue to be an overcomer. I am a new man, I'm not the man I used to be. And let me tell you, it's not through anything I am doing of my own accord. It is through the power of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that I am being sanctified and ready to be received into his presence. And Jesus would go on and he did many signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in the book, but it says this, and I'll conclude with this, but these are written... What we have here is the gospel. What we have here is the word of God. And it is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So don't weep, but rejoice. And again I say rejoice, says Paul. Today is a day of joy. Today was the day where man could truly say salvation is at hand. Death has been overcome. The graves have opened and we can now all go into the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. We're all a part of that now. And God will be with us and we will be with God for eternity. That's the peace I want. And that's the peace I pray for for everybody that listens to this message today. And may the Lord bless you.